Savvy Central Radio, drawing out the best from our guests with host Christina Nichman. Savvy Central Radio is proud to present a live interactive series featuring a new mix to business networking and interviews. Our second event will take place on May 23rd at Tornasol Wellness in Manhattan with our guest, Rochelle Kana, licensed clinical social worker. She'll share with us her new book, 30 Days of Prayer, Healing Autoimmunity for Women. This event is for health professionals, fitness experts, alternative care professionals, and anyone looking to create optimum wellness in their life. To find out more, book your free ticket today at bit.ly.com slash savvy event, the number two. That is bit.ly.com slash Savvy Event, the number two. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Savvy Central Radio. This is your host, Christina Nichman. Each week on Savvy, we host successful individuals and business owners, inviting them to share their dreams, stories, wisdom, and lessons learned in their field of business. Our guest today is Harris Glasser, a lighthearted, successful businessman with over 50 years of personal experience handling various financial situations for both himself and others and getting the desired results. Easy and at times really fun, his approaches weren't learned in school but were mastered through practice effort with real life experiences. Today, Harris shares some of his insights and wisdom surrounding finances and business. To find out more about Harris, visit his website at harrishelps.org. Hi, Harris. Welcome to Savvy Central Radio. How are you? Great. And yes, you sound terrific, Christina. You sound so upbeat. <laughs> yeah, I am upbeat today. It's a little icky outside, but it doesn't matter. We can have a fun time today as we talk about your wonderful book, It's My Money and I Want It. And guess what? We have a lot of business owners out there who want to keep their money as much of, as possible, but also help people out there in their business. So... Tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to creating your book, It's My Money and I Want It. Okay. At the age of 20, with a little wedding money, my dad lent me some money, not much. I started a little business, which was general contracting for city agencies, New York City. Hmm. And by the time I was 28, I was in pretty good shape. I decided to move along. It actually took four years to finish all the contracts. At 32, I was done. Oh, went down, went upstate, hung out in New York, hung out a little bit, had to do something. We started a little indoor farming business, which was growing sprouts. Mm -hmm. And within mm, two weeks, we were actually shipping a half a ton a week of sprouts down to New York. That's a lot of sprouts if you know how light they are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we sold that business. Then we went down to Florida for the winter, started the same thing down there. It was easy formula. Uh, didn't like Florida much. I guess I'm a New Yorker. <laughs> and we sold it, came back here. Our two sons were old enough. We started a daily car rental business, started with four vehicles. In about a year and a half, we had just about 80 vehicles. <laughs> Figured out a way, because I never liked to work hard, <laughs> All right. Oh, not anyone can work hard. It's how do you make more with less? Uh -huh. Fig figured out a way to reduce it down to 50 vehicles from the 80, made more, working less. Sold that business. Um, then went, went back to contracting with my two sons, and we still do that in a small way now. Mm. So through all the life experiences and all the years of helping people with advice for, as a result of all my experiences of what I learned, didn't learn, the book is just filled with all that. Mm. It's a book of true life experiences, lessons learned, lessons what to do, what not to do, what you can expect it'll, to happen if you do this or that. It's a great guidepost. The, the first, Christine, the first Hmm. section is for business people or those wanting to go into business and the second is for households which is for everybody mm -hmm. uh, we have a section with the IRS how to deal with them uh, and an entire section on articles from A to Z from retirement to dealing with credit cards vacation homes mm -hmm. moving all different ways to, to you know to save so this is great not only for the business owner out there but for their personal lives as well 
Oh, absolutely. So when you wrote your book, who were you thinking about when you wrote it? Was Were you thinking about all consumers or what were you thinking when you wrote the book that who could best benefit from it? It's a great question, Christine. <laughs> uh, yes, no, it really is. Who can benefit from it is anyone mm-hmm. from the time they need to handle money, income of any kind, which could be, you know, on from the first day they, they step onto a job, mm-hmm. right, and they're paying their own bills, not living at home, or even if they are, all the way to you're retired. Because it's funny, mm-hmm. on uh, it's what people get out of the book, it has to do with what you're talking about, who it's for. And everyone seems to get something else out of the book. Mm-hmm. Like one person said to me, he said, you know what the book is about? I said, do tell. He said, you're using money, business, personal monies, he says, as a basis for lessons in standing up for yourself and not being intimidated. Hmm. He says, and all the stories reflect that, whether it's in business dealing with a client or, you know, you're being dealt with or it's denied health insurance claims or anything. That's what it's about. I said, it's interesting. You really read between the lines. Hmm. And then... When I was on Bloomberg taking stock with Pim Fox, he picked up something else. He introduced me as, and now we have the man who teaches us how to squeeze more juice out of our orange. Mm. (laughs) Right. So that he got that also, that you don't need to make a zillion dollars Mm -hmm. to have more and live better Mm. and more. It's how you use your money and it's not about budgeting it. So that's what he saw Mm. was built into the book. So that's that's why it has to do with everyone from every walk of life. Mm. And I like that, Harris, because what I was considering with my friend a while back is that you don't get this in high school or even college. I mean, you'll take an economics course and you'll get into the nitty gritty of economics, but how to balance a checkbook or how to negotiate, even for your interviews or in such like that, you really aren't taught that stuff in school. And that's kind of sad. Yeah. And uh, I've always uh, pinned that Mm -hmm. as a problem. And I saw where that stemmed from was a person goes to high school, they graduate, they study their books, got their marks, they go to college, right? And they study the books and they get their marks and then they go on to become a professor and they're teaching from the books. Mm, But no one has a clue (laughs) as to what is really happening. And an interesting thing, which my dad had said to me, he said, when I was going into business, he said, Harris, in school, if you get a 90 average, wow, you're on the dean's list. (laughs) Fantastic. He said, well, that 10% that you didn't know that you got wrong Mm -hmm. in business, that's your profit. Mm. You've got to get 100 every day. And if you don't, well, it's going to cut into your profits. So there's a big gap between school and reality. And they can't teach it because they don't have the experience to teach it. They're just passing on book to book to book to book. Yeah. And I've often felt, and I don't know if you agree with me, Harris, that really – a lot of education really doesn't come from a book. It comes from, from experience. Perfect. Yeah. Perfectly said. And I think that's why there was this one teacher I had in high school. She was an Italian teacher. And she said, I don't believe in sitting here and just cracking open a book and teaching you Italian because you're not going to apply it to real life. So <laughs> we're going to go and take field trips every week to a different place. And you're going to have to speak Italian the whole time. You want to go to the bathroom, you want to order food, you want to do anything, you have to speak Italian. And I I thought it was a great idea because if you're going to apply something like business, go out there in the real world and and apply it in in a real fashion in which you would use it in a day-to-day basis, whether it's working with your finances or, or building a business and figuring out how to build a business plan or whatever it might be. That's a great understanding. My oldest son, when he got out of high school, uh, who's getting out of high school, and he said he wanted to go to college. And I said, okay, why? He said, well, all my friends are going. I said, <laughs> wrong reason. Why do you want to go to college? Uh, well, I want to learn to make money. Mm. Wrong reason. <laughs> I, I said, you know, if you, you, you want to go to college, you be a doctor, a lawyer, a dentist, an accountant. Well, you need to go to get those degrees, those licenses. Right, But just to go for the sake of going, Mm -hmm. I said, no. I said, if you want to learn to make money, I said, around the corner, there was a fast food place looking for a French fry maker. Mm. 
He said, I said, take the job. He says, no. I said, yes. Not that you're going to be a professional French fry maker, but watch <laughs> how business works. Now you're going to be on the other side of the counter. See what goes on. See what you like about it, what you don't, how you can improve upon it, what you learn from it. Then, after that, then, you know, you may decide you like business, you don't like business, whether you go to school or not. Mm -hmm. But this way you'll get a taste of mm -hmm. what it is to try and make money in business. That is wise, amazing advice there. Early on, one of my very first intros into business was working in a small copy shop in Manhattan. And I learned so much about how to deal with customers. I had to work the cash register. And I found that when we would take orders in, it was kind of random. You would just throw them at a person and they would go to random machines and do the job. And I started to see a problem that we were getting backed up with clients out the door, not getting their orders done mm. and out the door on time. And what it was is that people would just pick a machine they liked and take whatever job came in and use that machine to complete the job. It wasn't always the right copy machine for the job. Uh -huh. So I, right. looking at it, said, you know what, I think we could get this done better if we used the machine appropriate for the job. Someone comes in and wants 175,000 copies of a piece of paper. We have a machine back there that kicks butt and can do like 15,000 copies a minute. Mm -hmm. that's the machine that should be used for that and then this machine does color you know so I started to work it out and I said e each person will pick a machine today I will hand them the job based on what type of job it is to the proper machine and the machine operator for that machine today will get it done and then it'll be like an assembly line you know we'll just pass it down and uh, we got the jobs out a lot quicker but it was just being in that atmosphere and seeing how things run it gives you an idea that you can apply these type of things to working with customers and process is in all business. Yeah, I have a chapter in a book dedicated to you, what you just said. It's called Being Organized. Mm. Well, you organized it. Mm -hmm. And as a result, everything would run smoother, mm -hmm. less effort, profits would go up, you do more business, working easier. Yeah, easy, like easy. <laughs> like easy. Anyone could work hard. Mm. But, you know, when you're working easier, your mind is clearer, you're, you're less stressed, you're more chilled, and you begin to see. Like the people who were there, mm -hmm. they were so caught up because there's people walking out the door and they had to get the work out. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. Whoa, they didn't see what was right in front of their nose, what you saw, which, by the way, is not in any textbook. That's what right. What you saw and did. That's right. And I think I got the process at the moment from thinking about the assembly line at a factory. It's set up in such a fashion that each person has their, and each machine has their specific niche right. that they accomplish a task. And I said, well, let's not apply that idea to this shop. It's, again, it's from, you, you said it, mm -hmm. it comes from being in the field, in the experience. Yeah. You know, I look at the youngsters in, in college taking, and they're majoring in business mm -hmm. and marketing and management. Yep. And I say, oh my God, when they go out there, they are going to get chewed up and spit out by business. Yeah, it doesn't, yeah. Yeah. So now what I'm wondering, Harris, is because I'm seeing a lot of people go out to college and, and it's awful, but a lot of the credit card companies go and approach them and say, hey have the life you want you can buy anything you want and pay later no interest for <laughs> up to six months to a year what would you tell young people out there in their 20s or teens just going up to college and they're getting tempted by the credit card craze okay that was a thing i had asked my dad when i went to business mm -hmm. i said dad how much money do i need to make to be rich <laughs> <laughs> i want to be rich and he said well first of all he said well harris what would you do if you were rich eat two extra pieces of pizza, wear an extra pair of pants. Mm. Well, I was like, okay, got it. He says, just go to work, be happy. I said, I got it. But dad, how much money do I need to make to be rich? Mm. He said, okay, here's the deal. If you always spend $1 less than you earn, you always be rich. But if you always spend $1 more than you earn, no matter how much you earn, You'll always be poor. Mm. So now, some advice. Okay, that's the first piece of advice. Christine, there are two reasons, and only two reasons, that we need to make money. One is our survival, our needs. Mm -hmm. That's that's one. The other is our for our entertainment, our enjoyment, our desires. Mm. So it's our needs and our desires. There's no other reasons to make money. That's it. Mm. Okay. The problem comes in 
when we start mistaking our desires for our needs. Mm. So, before you get see those credit cards with all kinds of, we're going to give you this and that, you have to separate desires for needs. And a perfect story of that from business is a partnership, two guys that I knew, and they split everything equally, but one one was more slanted towards desires, the other was more slanted towards needs. So every couple of years, every two years, they would they would rent new vehicles. They would lease them. Mm-hmm. And one of them, he had to have his big shiny whatever it was, you know, big set of wheels. They were doing very well. He got himself a big set of wheels. And the other guy, you know, nothing terrible, nice car, it just wasn't, you know, a big expensive car and he would pocket the difference Mm -hmm. between the cost of the two cars after about 10 years sometimes you know life has a way of turning on us and they wound up business went bad and they went out of business they lost everything Mm -hmm. now the one who with the big shiny car well he had 10 years of like oh when i was on top you had to see the car i was driving (laughs) he he had nothing but a hole in his pocket Mm -hmm. the other fellow well, he couldn't say that, but he had $100,000 in the bank, which he's now able to go back in business and went on to be successful. Mm. Don't mistake your desires for your needs. Yeah. Spend a dollar less than you earn and you'll always be rich. Yeah. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Now, for being a business owner, I know a lot of new business owners tell me a great temptation is deciding what is a true investment for my business that I need in order to grow my business and what is something that will actually I don't need right now yeah <laughs> I saw the uh, and that comes in all kinds of shapes and forms that mm-hmm. question right so I had sold the car rental business now the fellow who bought it I told him he should be hiring a certain person so and so who was a manager at a uh, a a competitive place but was looking to move on Mm -hmm. and he spoke to him and he spoke to his lawyer and accountant and he said to me no they told me I can't afford to hire him Mm. okay about and he gave me quite a large down payment and then you know like five six years of payments to come on top of the payment down payment well after about three months he came back he said please please keep my money keep my down payment take the business back I can't do this anymore. Hmm. He says, I wake up in the middle of the night and sweats. That's what he said. I said to him, well, no, not taking the money business back. You're keeping the business. But now what you're going to do is you're going to hire this other fellow. Hmm. But my accountant, I said, please. Hmm. Well, he hired him. He paid him a lot of money. Well, it was such a marriage that after a while, he gave him his own Mercedes. Mm. And he got a, a newer one. Listen to this. <laughs> and I said to him, now, his name was Sandy. I said, now, here's the lesson. First of all, accountants know accounting. Lawyers know law. They know nothing about business. Mm. You ask a businessman about business. And then you ask a few because you know, some may be better than others. Okay? Mm. And I said, here was the point. What to invest in was your question? Yeah. I said, he... The fellow I told you hi was your best investment because he wasn't going to cost you money. He was going to bring a clientele over with him on top of running your business super efficiently. Mm-hmm. So he would not cost you money. He would make you money and grow your business. Mm, that is a really good point. Looking at the back end, is this investment in the long end or not even in the long end, but in the very short term going to make money for my business or cost me money? Yes, mm. yes, yes. And, you know, in terms of going into business starting out, one of the things I advocate is uh, people have a bookkeeper or accountant, and there's a, uh, a set, in the set of books, there's a called cash disbursements, mm-hmm. and there's your cash receipts book. And I always tell people starting out in business for months on end, you enter every check you write into the cash disbursements book yourself. Do not have the bookkeeper or your accountant do it. And the same thing with all the monies that come in each day or week, however often you do it. You enter them personally. The difference is 
that cash receipts and disbursements books are now written in blood. You see, because instead of the accounting showing you at the end of the quarter mm -hmm. some massive spreadsheets with all the receipts, you know, cash receipts and all the disbursements that look like a big blur, mm -hmm. you, when you're entering each one, you're going to start to get a feel. And you may say, wow, you know, I've been expending a lot for, uh, I don't know, telephones or you know, yellow page ads or whatever it is. The point is it's going to talk to you because you are the one that's talking to it as you're entering it. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with your cash receipts. You may start to see, wow, you know, these people are good payers, but they're not as good as these others. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe I'd like to offer an inducement to this one or to that one. It's going to talk to you. It's going to teach you about your own business. So I would say for the first six months, you do your own bookkeeping. I mean, you have an accountant mm -hmm. doing all your filing, actually. You take care of your own books and records. You do that. That's, that's a place to invest your time in. That, that is fabulous advice because how many business owners have come to tell me, it's like, I don't want to handle that. Same with sales. I'm going to let someone else handle that. And I, I even think personally for sales, especially the start of your business, who knows your product, service, or information better than you? It's your life. It's your passion. Yeah, you know, those who do that wind up going out of business. <laughs> There's no such thing as I don't want to. Yeah. It's, your, it's, it's your livelihood. It's your business. You have to put it this way. Uh, I was 20 years old, became a contractor, you know, bidding city work, rehabbing schools, New York City schools you, you must be familiar with, mm -hmm. uh, New York City hospitals. When I was 28, I decided it was enough. At that time, there were no computers. There were no cell phones. There weren't even copy machines. Christine, mm -hmm. everything was done with carbon paper. Mm -hmm. Yet I had – took an inventory. I, I didn't realize how big the business had grown on me. I had 69 contracts running simultaneously, right, ranged everywhere from 50000 to a million and a quarter. And every job – Brooklyn Municipal Building, I caught in Jerolamon, you may know that building. Every job had windows, doors, floors, painting uh, – do hardware, you name it. Yet, because I would start off every job myself with the receipts and disbursements book on every job and the listing of the subcontractors and, and where the materials bought, being bought, there wasn't a thing without cell phones, without computers, that I didn't know about any single one of those jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what's good about that, and, and this brings back to mind what I did a number of years ago, just to get an idea for my personal finances – there was a lot of money floating out of my personal finances and I couldn't say where it was going. So, you know, because you take cash at the ATM and, and before mm -hmm. you know it, it's all gone. So I started carrying around a notebook where I recorded everything, even a stick of gum if I bought some gum or something. And, Perfect. Yeah, and I found I was spending a good portion on junk food, like $20 a day or something on random junk food here and there. And I, I cut that out for two, two reasons. One, uh, money, and number two, um, get, lost some weight on top of it. <laughs> But uh, what you're saying here makes sense because now you have a handle on your numbers. You have a handle of what's going in and out. So when you do hire an accountant and they start giving you different numbers for whatever reason and it goes sky high, you're like, no, 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 no. I know how much it costs to run this business. Those numbers are wrong. Something's up. Right. I had an accountant because when you do city and state work, you have to do financial statements. They're certified. And uh, I asked the accountant at the end of the six months, he did a statement. I said, so, I'm kidding him. I said, so, Charlie, how am I doing? <laughs> He said, Harris, he says, are you kidding me? If I have to tell you how you're doing, you're in trouble. He says, you know better than me before I even walk in here. Mm. Now, what you just said you did was phenomenal. I was on a show. The wife was a best-selling author, mm. a financial advisor, and so was her husband a financial advisor. And it was funny because they just had me back uh, two days ago on the show. And say she wanted some closing advice. And I said, tell you what. Every day, whether it's just a stick of gum like you just said, whether it's a check or credit card, I want you to record every single penny that you spent throughout the day. Mm -hmm. I want you to write it down. She says, okay. And she did that for two months and had me back on the third month. She said, Harris, I was blown away. It was like Christmas came early. Mm. I could not believe where the money was leaking. And the thing is, before we go spend large money items, mm -hmm. whether it's a house, a car, or you know, expensive piece of jewelry, whatever, we think about it, we contemplate it. We don't think about 
all those ones and fives and tens and singles that go out all day. Mm. And that's where it is. I could tell you a great one on that one. Mm. Okay. <laughs> My wife and I, we love to travel. We go away three times a year. Right. I don't make a Z in dollars. And people ask me, how do you do that? So I said to a friend of mine, and he knew what I was going to say on the interview coming up. He said, Harris, please don't take my one pleasure away from me today. What was it? I said on the show, I said, we're talking about this. I said, I have a friend. He and his wife, every morning they stop at the Starbucks. (laughs) It's three or three and a half dollars each couple, whatever, seven bucks. And maybe they do that twice a day or something. Fourteen bucks at the end of five, six days. They just spent 80 some odd dollars. Mm. I have my cup of water in the the house. It's a cup of water. That's what it is. You know, pick up some stuff from the local bakery, keep in the house. That's it. At the end of the year, it's eight thousand. It's four thousand dollars. Yeah. Well, I said to him. I won't take your pleasure away from you, but my $4,000, I'm going to Europe for two weeks. Uh Uh-huh. It's just the allocation. Where do you want to spend it? Do you want it on a daily basis or do you want to save it up for a trip to Europe? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Uh, So that's what it is. You know, learning to squeeze more juice out of your orange. You don't need to make a fantastic amount of money to really live well. Yeah. just... It's, it's the allocation. It's knowing how to use it. It's not budgeting. It's not about budgeting. Yeah, I like that, that you mentioned the budgeting. Because many years ago, I read a book, um, and it was about five gals who had saved up money, and they actually were able to pay down their debt of 150000 That was cumulative mm-hmm. between the five of them. Right. But what was interesting about it is they said, you know, there's ways you can save money on things you're not even using. Like, <laughs> do you watch cable at night? And I'm like... You know, or do you go out every night because you're just tired and you don't feel like putting on some pasta on the stove right. and you order out and then you pay the takeout guy? I mean, so I started looking at stuff like that. And I think in one month I cut back on cable because I was never watching it. So I eliminated it. Um, my cell phone, I barely ever use. They told me at Verizon, uh, do you ever even use your phone? <laughs> It was true. I didn't even spend a hundred minutes a month. That's so I dropped it and got it as a pay as you go phone where I pay twenty five dollars every three months now. You're squeezing more juice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there's way to squeeze juice and I the one thing I didn't give up actually was the flavored coffee outside for four bucks, which I do do, but I found other ways to get my juice. Yes. 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 You know, I enjoy eating out, and here's a great thing. Mm. One, I enjoy a glass of wine. We'll have a glass of wine, my wife and I, but never have it in a restaurant because even the house red is 8 or $9 at least. Tax and tip is 25% tax and tip, and you're paying $12, $13. The two glasses now cost $25. Instead, I'll go to Trader Joe's, and they have imported wines from yeah. all over the world, Spain, Australia, you name it, that kind of wine, and you can get a top wine for $8 from anywhere in the world. So the difference is now the two glasses cost 25, so four glasses cost 50. Yeah. Well, our bottle of wine cost eight. Nice. And you have it in the comfort of your own home, which is very mellow and relaxing. Next, we'll never have dessert in a restaurant. First of all, I don't like to stuff a dessert on top of a meal. I want my pasta and stuff to go down. (laughs) Okay? You have a dessert. If you have a a dessert and a cup of coffee, that's another eight, nine bucks each person. Tax tax and tip, two people, is $25. No way. We'll stop on the way home, and maybe one of us wants some Haagen-Dazs. Uh, maybe one of us wants some stuff in the t- local Italian, Greek, or uh, Italian pastry, mm-hmm. and we'll pick it up. Believe me, you save it instead of twenty-five. You, you're spending five. You save a twenty-dollar bill. You know, between there and the wine, it's fifty dollars once a week on eating out. That's twenty-five hundred. I went for nine days to Aruba for twenty-six hundred. Nice. See, when you put it in these terms, then you see how you can save money for your business, for your life, and, right. and just in general, and and still have a good time. Like you said, you don't have to. This doesn't have to be measures in which you don't have, you don't live, and you don't enjoy life. Not at all. In yeah. fact, you enjoy it more. There's no stressing. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun. You're not paying all these credit card debts down and worrying about how to pay those puppies down. You're, you've paid up. So it's been so much fun talking to you today, Harris. And before we head on out, is there anything you'd like to share with the audience before we part? Well, the first thing is my website, which is harrishelps.org, H-A-R-R-I-S, helps.org. They could see the book. They could read the pages on there and watch the video. What would I like to share? Spend a dollar less, you'll always be rich. A dollar more, you'll always be poor. Question everything. 
a last story. I wa- I needed a good head set of headphones. I walked into PC Richard. It was a twenty nine ninety nine and a fifty nine ninety nine. One had more bells and whistles, <laughs> which was really a good one. But I just say, could you do better? What? And I just, I don't know. I'll get back to you. And as I'm walking out, he's just, ah, eh, come on back. I'll give you that one for twenty nine ninety nine. Ha. Yes. Thank you. I'm telling you. Everything is negotiable. Everything Absolutely. is negotiable. Even without negotiating, they don't want to lose the sale. I had $30 more on my checkbook when I walked out of there. And, by the way, I've, I've had that happen in my business. There's people who want to work with me who, whatever reason, whatever package we have set up isn't just quite right for them. They're ready to walk away. And they said, but, you know, I really want to do something with you. I'm like, let's talk. Let's see if we can right. put something custom together just for you that fits perfectly, that works for you financially in every which way. So it's a win-win for both of us. You're so, you know, you're very smart. I have to tell you, I, what I always tell people in a deal is it's not a good deal. If only I come out well, it's or only you. It's a good deal when we both walk away doing good. And that way, we'll keep coming back to each other. That's right. Absolutely. It's been so fabulous talking to you, Harris. Thank you so much. And everyone, please go check out It's My Money and I Want It. Because, yes, we want to keep our money. And go to HarrisHelps, with an S, dot org today. And thank you, Harris, for coming to Savvy Central Radio. Absolutely. It was a great time. Savvy Central Radio is proud to present a live interactive series featuring a new mix to business networking and interviews. Our second event will take place on May 23rd at Tornasol Wellness in Manhattan with our guest, Rochelle Khanna, licensed clinical social worker. She'll share with us her new book, 30 Days of Prayer, Healing Autoimmunity for Women. This event is for health professionals, fitness experts, alternative care professionals, and anyone looking to create optimum wellness in their life. To find out more, book your free ticket today at bit.ly.com slash savvy event, the number two. That is bit.ly.com slash savvy event, the number two.